Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Cecilia Francescon. I'm an international environmental lawyer and I'm also a senior policy advisor on foreign policy with a special focus on G7, G20 processes. Let me thank uh, Formica, first of all, as well as China Med Project and to China Hub. And I wish in particular to thank Enrico Ferdella, Paolo Messa, Francesco Becchis and Martina Poletti. Thank you so much. And uh, I think if throughout uh, all these uh, days and sessions, you have shown uh, that partnerships uh, can deliver and can also provide an open platform for uh, debates. And today we will uh, address uh, the one on global warming up, uh, the emerging joint quest for climate sustainability and its impact on global connectivity and security. The aim of this session is to dive into emerging challenges that climate change poses to the global security, as well as investigate the potential areas of cooperation to be addressed by the international community. There's no doubt that climate change is not just an environmental issue. It is also an industrial one, as well as a, a geopolitical one. Our keynote speaker today is, and for this session, is a Professor Colin Price. Thank you so much for being with us, Professor. He is a researcher and lecturer in atmospheric sciences at the School of Geosciences of Tel Aviv University. And he's also head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies. I, I will then open up the floor to three distinguished guests. Uh, Dr. Corrado Clini, Mr. Giulio Bonazzi, and Mr. Stefano Marguccio. Thank you all for being here with us today. But first, I will pass the virtual floor to Professor Colin Price. Please, Professor. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have the opportunity to share my screen? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the climate crisis. I was asked also to put this in the context of connectivity and uh, the links between the Mediterranean and, and China. Um, so I've done my best, uh, but I'm a climate scientist, so I'll still give some background on the science first of what we know. And I like to start by showing this uh, image of the, the Earth with a fever. And uh, when we talk about global warming and the climate crisis, uh, we're talking about the uh, temperatures of the earth going up and uh, I like to compare it also to the human body that when we have a fever and we're not feeling well uh, Normally our body we all know now from COVID that our when we have to test our temperature that our temperature is 37 degrees or 36.5 when we're feeling fine and When we have a fever of one degree two degrees, we are in bed. We're not well. We're acting all strangely and if it goes up by three or four degrees we could be could be fatal, we could be in hospital. Well, the earth has got a very similar fever, except instead of the average temperature being 37 degrees, the average temperature of the earth is 15 degrees. So one or two degree warming relative to a 15 degree average is much more significant actually for the earth than for a human, a one degree warming. And so the same as we don't act nicely and we uh, have anxiety and we don't want to speak to people when we're feeling sick, well, the Earth's starting to also act a little strange when it storms or wildfires or heat waves, sea level rise around the planet. And these are the symptoms we're seeing actually now because of the fever that the Earth has. And I hope this movie works. Actually, it doesn't, but I, I think it's worth to, um, I'm gonna stop this for a second to share another screen um, to show you this movie which basically shows the different countries of the world and how actually um, the temperature has been changing. Well, let's start from the beginning of the movie from the 1880s. So you can see the year at the top here. Each one of these names a different country of the world and the circles represent the change in temperatures relative to 1950s, 60s, 70s. So the, the period of the middle, you can see at the bottom here, 1950s to 1998. And so if we run this movie, we'll see that every year the colors of these circles change. The size of the circle represents the anomaly, the change, whether it's either cooler in blue or warmer 
than the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And you can look for your country. Uh, um, Israel and Italy are in the middle here, next to each other, alphabetically. And basically, as we go to the 1980s, the 1990s, and eventually it'll end in 2017, you see everything becomes orange and red. And it ends in 2017 with Israel 1.1 degree warmer than the 1950s, 60s, 70s, Italy 1.4 degree warmer. But there's no place on earth which is cooling at the moment. Every place, every country is getting warmer with time. And this is the big worry. So I'm going to go back now to the, the PowerPoint. Apologize for that. It didn't work before in the inside the PowerPoint. Um, and if we actually look at the real temperature data, this is the actual data collected from all the weather stations around the world from 1850s to today. The red dots represent the annual mean, so averaging all the data we have measured. And uh, we can see actually that um, this is what we define the global warming a relative again to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which is this zero line, the dashed line in the middle. As I mentioned, the average temperature of the Earth is about 15 degrees. And at the 18, end of the 1800s, it was about 0.5 degrees cooler. And today, we're nearly a degree warmer. But what's also interesting is these vertical error bars, which basically show the uncertainty we have, because we aren't really measuring everywhere on the planet. And back 100 and so years ago, we had a lot, lot larger uncertainty than we have today. Today, we have satellites and ships and other means to get the temperature. And uh, as we have more and more good data, we're seeing that the, the, the planet is getting warmer and warmer. And in fact, the last few years are the warmest years on record. Nine, the two, year 2000 and 2016 were the two warmest years we've recorded since we've had the thermometer. And I'll talk about that in a second. The thermometer we've only had for a few hundred years. But since the temperature record started, the, the last every decade is warmer than the previous decade, going back to the 1950s and 40s. As I mentioned, we don't have temperature data, thermometer data, more than a few hundred years. That's the red curve we just saw. So we have to develop scientific methods to go even further back in time to see whether this is really anomalous. And so we use different methods like tree rings and pollen sediments in lakes and oceans, ice cores, corals. And therefore, we can get this blue curve, which is showing the last thousand years, the temperature, um, and relative, again, to today. So the zero here is not the zero degrees. This is the reference of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And in fact, the temperatures of the globe were actually slightly cooling over the last thousand years. Um, and then came the Industrial Revolution, which changed the patterns, and we started going up and it continues today. So we're off the, or off the charts already in the 2020. So uh, I guess most people know that this is due to what we call the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is basically similar to a greenhouse. It's not the best comparison, but a greenhouse has these transparent windows, whether it's plastic or glass, letting the sunlight in, warming the plants in the ground and not allowing the heat to go out. Many of you may have noticed if you park your car on a cold winter day outside in the sun, when you come back to your car, it's nice and warm in the car. That's the greenhouse effect. The sunlight comes through the windows, but the heat doesn't escape out. Well, uh, on our planet Earth, instead of the windows, we have an atmosphere. And the atmosphere has the same role of letting the sunlight in, but the heat, which is emitted from the surface, gets trapped in as though we're putting blankets over the Earth. And in fact, the gas, the 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 part of the atmosphere which is doing most of this work on a natural scale is water vapor h2o the water vapor traps in a lot of the heat and warms us up from actually what we would have been without an atmosphere it would be minus 18 degrees the average temperature the oceans would be a block of ice and we wouldn't be sitting here today talking to each other so it's good we have a greenhouse effect the problem is that we're now enhancing that and we're putting more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere the main greenhouse gases, as you probably know, are carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs, ozone, nitrous oxide. And these are from all the different activities around the planet, whether it's generating electricity, producing our food, uh, agriculture, livestock, our transportation, industry. And we can see on these plots here the different gases which are being measured continuously in the atmosphere, that all of them are rising. And again, these, we call them greenhouse gases because they have 
the role similar to the the windows on the greenhouse, uh, like putting more blankets or on our on the planet, which are trapping in more and more heat. And that's basically what's causing the global warming. And we can see here that when we talk about the carbon emissions or carbon dioxide over the last 100, 150 years, um, it started out fairly slowly. Initially, we used mainly coal, the fossil fuel, to for our trains and for heating our homes and producing uh, uh, heating and lighting. Um, in the 20th century, that became more prevalent using oil, and then natural gas is, is kicking in. But something's happened just in the last few years here, in the last uh, 15 years or so, where coal has again taken over. And if we zoom into that, we can see here that the fossil fuel emissions from carbon dioxide, um, the highest emissions come from coal again, which is only from 2005. And this brings us again to the topic of the, the workshop and of talking about China, because if we look down here, this is the total emissions from coal, oil, natural gas, and even cement. But if we look by country below, you can see that China around about 2000 started taking off with all the development in China. And since about 2005, China emits a lot more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases than the United States, which is the main emitter until then. But we also need to point out that the impact of carbon dioxide on climate change is really the integrative effect, the area under these curves. And so United States is still the biggest culprit because they've been emitting high amounts for a very long time. Well, uh, people may ask whether this is really something anomalous, <coughs> these greenhouse gases, the increases. Um, what happened before a thousand years? Before we have uh, um, data, say, on temperature and other parameters, so we've developed various tools to try to understand the climate going back hundreds of thousands of years ago. And one of the main tools is from uh, ice cores, which are mainly in the two big ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. Yeah, you can see, I think the Russian uh, Vostok base in Antarctica, you can see these scientists holding pieces of this ice core, which is drilled into the ice. Uh, the ice forms when snow falls down and over some time gets compacted and then forms into ice. Um, and what's amazing about ice is that when it forms the ice, the air bubbles in the snow get trapped inside. And so if we, and, they, and the air in those bubbles represents the atmosphere when the ice formed. So if the ice formed 100,000 years ago and we open those bubbles today, then we can actually measure the amount of carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere back then. So that's what we can see here. This is a 2000 year record of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, from the year 2000 more or less going back it's actually 2005 going back 2000 years and these you can see a, a slice of one of these ice cores the little white dots are the air bubbles inside and you can then we can then measure the amount of carbon dioxide in red methane in blue nitrous oxide in in, uh, in black and we see that all of them were fairly stable over 2000 years. The, the units are slightly different, but they were fairly stable. And then again, the industrial revolution came and they all took off. They all started to shoot up, um, going up into the, the, and still continue today to increase. Again, due to all of our activities of using energy, using fossil fuels, agriculture. Um, it can go 10,000 years back in time. So zero is today and 10,000 years back in time. And here too, carbon dioxide on the top, methane, nitrous oxide. The different colors are from different, um, different ice cores, um, different drilling areas. So you can see that they basically follow each other. And again, was very stable over 10,000 years until the Industrial Revolution when things took off. Now, some skeptics may say that the data is not good and we don't really know and there's a lot of uncertainty, but there's no no natural explanation of how we have such a dramatic rise in all the greenhouse gases um, after 10,000 years of stability. Nothing natural happened here. The only thing that happened was the Industrial Revolution. And I fo focus really on, and this is also for maybe the discussion, on the last 10,000 years, because uh, we could go back further, but all of our civilizations on planet Earth, from the Romans, the Egyptians, the Greeks, all developed in this period of ten, the last 10,000 years. And our cities have been built in the last 10,000 years at a coastline 
which was constant for 10,000 years. The temperatures, the rain patterns, everything, the climate was more or less constant and stable over this 10,000 year period. And we built our infrastructures, our cities, our economies based on the climate, which is now starting to dr dramatically change and will continue to change unless we do something fast. And again, uh, the main cause of the rise in the greenhouse gas is uh, from the Industrial Revolution. This resulted in people living longer uh, and the, dr the dramatic increase in the world's population. This is looking at 10,000 years of history where we can see here before the common era and after. And we went just in the last 200 years from less than a half a billion people to more than 7 billion people in 200 years. And those 700, 7 billion people all need food. They need uh, something. A lot of them want and have electricity, transportation. Uh, and this is basically the, the cause for the rising greenhouse gases, which are then uh, affecting the temperature of the planet. So the potential impacts for the future, when we look at all climate models, which is the field that I come from, we see that all the simulations show that we're going to have a warmer planet in the next decades to the end of the century. There's no single model which says that we're going to have a cooler climate. And this implies also heat waves and wildfires and droughts. We're also going to see changes in rainfall patterns, which are going to be in some places be less rainfall, other places more rainfall. So some it will be flooding, other places more drying, and sea level rise. And just these three parameters have major impacts in our day-to-day -day lives when we're talking about our health, we're talking about malaria or dengue fever or even epidemics. The coronavirus is, wasn't produced by global warming, but there are many studies which show that the destruction of habitats in the rainforests and the changes in the temperature and the climate in tropical regions can cause exotic species to migrate out and to actually then interact with domesticated animals like cows and pigs, which we eat. And so climate change can definitely have impacts on our health. Agri agriculture, of course, due to changes in rainfall patterns, temperature, both droughts, but also pests, which can eat those uh, locusts. Locusts can eat the, the, um, the agricultural products. Forests uh, also suffer from climate and forest fires, as well as pests. Water resources in our part of the world, the Mediterranean, water resources are key for uh, both the amount of water, the quality of water, and even the geopolitical environment here is all really related to water resources, which will change in the future and are changing at the moment. Obviously, coastal areas due to sea, sea level rise, erosion, and obviously biodiversity, loss of habitats because of things like deforestation, um, and which have also direct effects on the climate, but also maybe on epidemics. So just one example from our region um, is looking at the Nile Delta. And what may happen, this is the Nile Delta and the coastline of Egypt today. This would be the coastline if it, the sea level rises by 0.5, half a meter, and by one meter. And this is predicted by the end of the century, uh, one meter sea level rise globally. Um, Alexandria, Port Said, places along the delta will be underwater. And today, without it taking into, into account the growth of population there, today there's 6.1 million people who live in this blue region, which is within one meter of sea level rise. And so this is obviously going to cause problems with the refugees, migrants, climate refugees due to sea level rise. But uh, not only sea level rise, the global warming is going to result in many changes in disasters in the future, whether it's sea level rise, heat waves, floods, typhoons. And once we have disasters and climate impacts, this can result in the displacement of populations, um, displacement of populations into refugee camps where we have displaced persons and normally uh, not very good conditions. And in many circumstances like that, we get recruitment of various uh, populations into some uh, maybe militant groups, non-state actors, and this can often result in conflicts. And this cycle of events has been studied in the past and not too far from us, we've seen that this may have been a, an a event multiplier in the Syrian civil war. If we look at the timeline of events in Syria, um, from about 2005 to 2010, there was an extreme drought there. 
Now, even before that, they had started with the refugees from Iraq because of the American war in Iraq. But there was a lot of internal displacement because of the drought. The people were leaving their farms. They ran out of underground water. Um, and the, the Damascus and other big cities became overcrowded. And this resulted in perhaps, according to if we follow this uh, flow chart here, the drought, which occurred for many years, together with the increase in population, results in water scarcity. Water scarcity results in the reduction of the agricultural productivity. Both of these can result in more urbanization, moving into the, the big cities. Um, in, the, in the rural areas, reduced agricultural productivity can result in unrest in the rural areas, also in the urban areas from overpopulation. All of this can result in a weakened state, which can then result in popular uprising and even a civil war, which we see ongoing in, in Syria today, and the refugee problem that we saw in Europe to Europe in 2015. So when we talk about connectivity of populations and the climate change, especially in the Mediterranean, where uh, many of the countries are really stressed for water, for food security, um, climate change is going to worsen the situation and going to result in more migration, more climate refugees, which are going to impact both Israel, but also Europe, as we saw in 2015. So now if we talk a little bit, just a few more, two more slides about the, the solutions and the geopolitical issues in this region and, and the role of China, actually. Well, this is an interesting map because it shows you by the size of the country who has the oil today on planet Earth. And the color shows you who's using that oil. And so obviously we can see that the Middle East dominates with the sources of the oil. Uh, the United States, Canada, Russia, or maybe the big users um, although, um, if, if we want to think of what may happen, you can see how small Europe is. If we want to think how the geo geopolitics would change in this part of the world if we didn't rely on oil anymore, uh, this would really be a game changer in many, in many areas, especially for us here in Israel. And from various, uh, look, now bringing China into the picture, if we look at the survey of the citizens which consider climate change as a major threat, we can see that China is way ahead. The Chinese citizens, 73% of them th feel that climate change is a major threat to society. Uh, even the European Union is less than 50% and the US less than 40%. So there's major emphasis on China, I think, on climate change at the moment. And uh, we also heard the President Xi, his, uh, his statements not long ago, saying, stating that China will be uh, zero, net zero emissions uh, by the year 2060. Um, this is a, a major challenge, and hopefully uh, they'll meet this challenge. But uh, this shows that China really sees climate change as a problem, and they want to be part of the solution. And maybe uh, we can see what's happening in China, that basically if we look at the investments in billions of dollars in renewables in the last few years, we can see that basically the, the China is leading the way with renewables, more than $120 billion in 2017, a lot more than, than uh, Europe and the other countries. And if we look at the electric car sales that are surging, in China. Again, China is way ahead of the other countries when they're investing in electric cars. And just the final slide is to show this, this vision that China has for the year 2070 of basically building a grid of connecting all the places where we have renewable energies around the world, investing there, but then also connecting to other places in the world to sell them that energy, a total length of 180,000 kilometers, covering more than 100 countries, 80% of the population will be covered, and 90% of the economic volume. You can see here the grid, which uh, this is, again, a vision for 2070. And the different symbols here, you can see the solar power base, say, in North Africa, to build so solar power plants, a hydropower base, in the, high, in the areas where we have big rivers, like in China or in Central Africa, in Congo, wind power more in the North Sea and other places. And so 
basically to sum up my talk, China is has been a problem and is a problem like most of us, but can, is definitely going to be a big part of the solution. And so I, I always like to see half the cup full, not half the, half the cup empty. And I think that China is going to have a major role in solving the problems of climate change in the future. And uh, I think they're already on their way. And so um, I think there's a very strong link between climate change, connectivity, and, uh, and China itself. So with that, I'll end my talk, and I'll be happy to answer questions or open the discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Price. Extremely interesting. I think uh, the science is pretty clear, and uh, as well as the consequences today. We cannot hide them anymore. I mean, I pretty much sure that, uh, I mean, the, how you explain the connection, the link between drought and conflicts, especially in Syria, but not only in Syria, is dramatic. And um, as well as in other parts of the world, of course, uh, sub-Saharan Africa as well. And, uh, and of course, it's great to see that there is a solution. It's not just a problem. So thank you very much for, for that. I will now open up the floor to our panelists. I will start with uh, Dr. Klini. Uh, Dr. Clini is a former Italian Minister for the Environment. He has spent before that uh, 20 plus years as Director General of that ministry. I was blessed enough to work for four years with Dr. Clini, which was one of the most fulfilling professional, if, and if I may say, personal growth uh, life experience. And, um, and amongst many, many other things, of course, uh, he is a visionary in the sense that he has the capacity to see before others. And uh, he has promoted a lot of international cooperation, starting with China, as well, of course, uh, uh, negotiating so many international environmental agreements. Plus, as today, he is also a senior advisor to two initiatives initiatives promoted by China. One is the Global Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization, which is uh, an international NGO made of uh, 2,100 plus, 2,150 plus enterprises, universities, research centers from China, Europe, US, Japan, India, and South Africa, as well as the Green BRI, and 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is a project in which participate experts from China, US, Canada, UK, Italy, Pakistan, South Africa, and Brazil, promoted by the China Council for International Cooperation and on Environment and Development. So Dr. Clini, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvia. I am very happy to share this uh, very interesting uh, panel. Let me say that uh, my first international cooperation was with Porter School in Tel Aviv in, uh, I believe, early 2000. And it was a very, very amazing experience. And yes, uh, I remember that. Uh, there was a special uh, Israel-Italy cooperation, the Ministry of Yeah, Program. yeah. Hi, Colin. I'm very happy to see you again. Let me, let me uh, say something about uh, the political uh, context uh, of climate change, the new landscape of climate change policies, because uh, in the last months, uh, I can say that everything changed. Uh, following the European uh, uh, commitment to, for the climate neutrality by 2050, China committed the carbon ne neutrality, and then uh, Japan, Canada, South Korea, and finally USA. President Biden, uh, last 21st of April, announced the commitment of U U.S. to reduce 
the carbon emissions by 55% in 2030. This is really a new landscape. I can say, if I uh, remember the very, very difficult negotiations we had in the last 30 years on climate change. I want also to underline that uh, the commitment of USA comes just a few days after the joint declaration of China and USA on climate change in Shanghai. Uh, John Kerry said that the cooperation with China is absolutely critical to address the challenge of climate change. And he said that climate has to stand alone. Climate change policy must be tackled separately from America's multiple differences with China. And this is very important because uh, we, uh, we know that uh, we have uh, a lot of problems, a lot of conflicts on many areas. But it's very important that the USA is committed to uh, address climate change in this context, together with China, Europe, uh, India, and the other countries. The key issue in this, uh, in this uh, new landscape is uh, the transition. And uh, in the decade that just began, the energy transition towards the decarbonization of the global economy is a very critical challenge. We know that we have a lot of discussion, a lot of, uh, of uh, <laughs> Uh, can say confrontation between uh, between the European Commission, uh, the the big oil companies, uh, and the single member states looking at Europe about uh, the so-called taxonomy, green taxonomy. The discussion is about the role of natural gas from one side and nuclear on the other side, because. Uh, if we look at the commitment for the carbon neutrality in 2050, by 2030, we have to change the energy metrics in the world economy and, of course, in the European economy. And I want to remember that last, uh, last 18 of May, uh, the International Energy Agency release the uh, net zero 2050 and the international energy is asking for the phase out of uh, exploitation of new oil and gas fields as well as for stopping the installation of new coal fire power plants so this is uh, <laughs> the contest, um, very, very challenging. And in this, uh, uh, we can uh, look uh, at the, the Mediterranean region and the possible options to work towards the decarbonization starting from the potential of renewables. If we look at the Global Solar Atlas released in December 2020, two months ago, by World Bank, we can see that the potential of global horizontal solar irradiation offers a very clear picture of the high capacity wells of solar energy in the southern Mediterranean region, 
both in North Africa and uh, in the Middle East, including uh, Israel. And uh, about the, the, the potential of solar energy, just solar energy, without considering uh, the other renewable, uh, many estimate that uh, the uh, potential could the potential of solar energy could meet the uh, uh, the energy demand of all the countries in the southern mediterranean region and at the same time the uh, uh, the solar energy could be uh, transferred to europe to cover more or less 20% of the energy demand, the electricity demand in, in Europe. To exploit such a potential, it would be necessary from one side to build the photovoltaic plants in the region. And on the other side, to build the network system to transmit electricity, both along the uh, Southern Mediterranean region and to Europe. We remember that uh, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, Desert Tech project uh, was based on this perspective. And then uh, it was not possible. The, the the implementation of the of the, the, the desert tech project today the same perspective is in the is the core of the project of the global energy interconnection initiative interconnection initiative launched in 2015 by china and uh, in, uh, in the, the first design of the global energy interconnection, we have the regional network, the interconnection between the, 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 the countries from Turkey to uh, Morocco. And on the other side, we have three ways for uh, uh, transmit electricity, uh, solar energy. Uh, to Europe uh, through three high capacity ultra high voltage direct current connection Egypt, Greece, uh, Tunisia, Sicily, Italy, Morocco, Spain. The project, uh, I can say, is uh, intuitive because. We have the potential of solar energy. We can exploit such a potential, we can use, and so we can replace fossil fuels with renewable energies, connecting the, 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 the sources of energy with the con consumers of energy. And it's very interesting also to take into account that uh, Many of the technologies to carry out this project are European. I want to mention Siemens, for example, or ABB, or the Italian Prismian. Uh, the technologies are ready, but also the cost is very interesting because uh, uh, the price of solar uh, photovoltaic, for, for example, declined by 90% in the last decade. And so we can say that the project is also cost effective. It's not also not only a project able to meet the energy demand uh, with the support of renewables, but it's also cost effective in comparison with the uh, traditional 
supply of uh, energy from fossil fuels, mainly oil, gas in the, re in the Mediterranean region. We are not in the world of wonders, <laughs> so we know very well that <laughs> the solution is very simple, but the implementation is not so simple. First, because uh, we know that it's very difficult uh, the replacement of fossil fuels, take into account the many of the countries in the southern Mediterranean region are uh, oil and natural gas producer and exporters. And the income of these countries is coming from a fossil fuel industry. And so we had to take into account that uh, to address climate change, to work towards decarbonization, we had to find a balance in order to manage the transition, looking at the future, having in mind the commitments for the decarbonization, but at the same time, taking into account that uh, we had to, uh, to meet the demand of economic growth of uh, the Southern Mediterranean region. And this is the, the challenge. I believe that uh, the uh, interconnection, the energy interconnection in the Mediterranean region could be a platform for managing such transition, taking into account that this uh, today can be a multilateral platform involving uh, Europe, involving China, involving USA, the African and Middle Eastern countries. I believe that we could work in this direction. This is the same direction uh, John Kerry suggested, uh, um, uh, sp uh, speaking about the competi competitive cooperation on climate change between the different economies. And I would like to, to suggest to worthwhile carefully the development of uh, a project announced by an English company, the name of the company is Klinks. The company wants to build 10 gigawatt uh, renewable energy in Morocco and connect it to the power network in UK through 3.6 gigawatt submarine cable. And uh, by the way, I want to remember that uh, uh, the Saudi energy ACWA power is a major shareholder of Clinks. And in turn, the Silk Road, Silk Road Fund is a 49% shareholder in ACWA. Something is happening. Something is happening in, uh, in, in I can say, in a, a context of uh, uh, the economic evaluation of the benefits of uh, the exploitation of the potential of renewables and of the transferring of renewables in Europe. Thank you so Last, much, uh, Corrado. We need uh, to move to have a, like a short conversation. Okay, I, I finish. After. Okay, grazie Silvia. <laughs> grazie a te. Thank you so much. I will now pass on, before asking questions, to Mr. Giulio Bonazzi. Giulio Bonazzi is the chairman and CEO of Aquafil, a leading company in the textile sector. I'm very fascinated by the transformation that he was able to make with his company. And uh, actually, he transformed his family manufacturing business into a sustainable global enterprise. 
And he has challenged his organization to develop recycled nylon material into a high quality fiber, which is also very, very beautiful. The company today, correct me, Mr. Bonazzi, if I'm wrong, has 16 plants in eight countries across three continents, which is pretty amazing. I leave the floor to you and uh, you have roughly eight to 10 minutes. And when we go back to uh, the, uh, the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. Well, uh, my comment is very simple. Uh, I do believe that all what the mankind is doing is wrong. And that is our responsibility to change. And that we don't have much time to change as this is my very simple way of uh, thinking. We at Aquafil started to our to try to really change our business that, I mean, if you consider that we make nylon polymers and fibers, we are completely dependent on oil and a highly energy intensive company uh, in 2007. And from 2007 to today, we have invented this uh, system uh, of depolymerizing nylon six. So we turn to the original building blocks of the material, which is possible only to a couple of plastic molecules. And the result is, 40% of our business coming from waste instead of oil derivatives, minus 70% of CO2 uh, emissions. But nevertheless, I have also to admit that we are not doing good yet. We are still doing less bad. So we need really to transform from doing bad into doing good, not simply to do less uh, bad. Uh, there are possibilities. Of course, uh, these possibilities are all connected uh, with major investment in research and development and major capital expenditures. If we have spent so much money to make the present society, we will spend at least the same amount of money to change it. And there is no free lunch. We may like it or we may not like it. And the sooner we begin, <laughs> the earlier we uh, arrive. And I do believe that if we want to change, we really need a strong position from our uh, policymakers, you know, I believe that an effective legislation is absolutely necessary. We have seen and we can see, we, I can bring also simple examples, maybe the one of plastic bottles, where there is a legislation that is forcing people to make bottles in a certain way, where there is deposit system in place and uh, collection of uh, bottles, they can arrive to 97% recycling rate. So I, my question is simple. Why don't we ask the entire world to take the same uh, legislation on board? If they want, they can even slightly improve to target an 98%, you know, but I believe that uh, we can very easily solve uh, the bottle problem. We at Aquafield, we can recycle nylon fishing nets, which means that if the entire world, instead of using whatever kind of fiber to make fishing nets, because it is less expensive, they start using nylon nets, we can easily resolve the problem of the nylon net and so on and so forth. The energy sector is exactly identical. We know that coal is the major problem today. Once we will resolve the coal problem, then will be oil, then will be natural gas. So we have to move toward the renewable or eventually, I do believe, for example, I am a, a strong sponsor of nuclear fusion technology. We know that there are companies including also European consortium that are investing a huge amount of money in trying to develop a nuclear fusion technology. But again, the lesson is very simple. You know, technology can save us. I believe the only way is developing better technologies. Of course, education is the second point because where we have better educated people, of course, we have also more probability to create a, uh, better income and possibility to consume better products and to understand what is good and what is bad. And then, of course, a complete redesigning, which I've just mentioned, of our society and of our way of manufacturing, as well of distributing products, including internet. We are now very recently learning how polluting bitcoins are, you know, because of highly energy <laughs> consumption. So again, it's a testimony that uh, uh, all what we are doing, as we are doing today, simply considering the short-term economical implications is wrong. If we go longer, for sure, we will start understanding that, uh, uh, you know, we can do better and there are already plenty of solutions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question, if I may, for you. Uh, so then um, uh, we can leave you. Um, you said the sooner we begin, the earlier we arrive. You definitely have uh, applied this concept to your own company, and that's why you are so successful today. Um, however, I see, at least at the European level, that uh, we have the trajectory, but still there is quite a lot of shyness in moving forward. Uh, it looks like uh, at least some sectors uh, um, of the society and the company and the business as well are holding back. Uh, don't you think that this way of doing things, I mean, this way of seeing the thing but being shy, being afraid, uh, is too risky today? Well, first of all, I think that uh, uh, we don't have Europe as a political body. You know, we have a European Commission, and uh, it seems that recently, thanks to the new presidency, Ms. von der Leyen, she's addressing, uh, uh, let's say, the green economy and climate change stronger than before. And this not because I believe uh, she is a great believer in green, but because very likely the Green Party in Germany is becoming the major party. So, of course, again, <laughs> the, the politics uh, is making uh, the difference, you know. Well, with regard to uh, the manufacturing companies, of course, it's not easy to change. You know, if to change a company like ours, which is relatively small, I mean, if I go to Wall Street, they consider myself a micro company, not an even a medium or, <laughs> or large uh, company. We may take something like 20 years, you can imagine to change a big petrochemical or chemical companies. Maybe it is also impossible to change. So, of course, they try to defend themselves and try to resist uh, to change and maybe also to make proposals that are, how can I say, sometimes misleading, uh, but because I am very polite uh, uh, today. And unfortunately, I must say, the bigger the companies, when they lie, the bigger the problems <laughs> that, of course, they create, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Thank you very much also for being so open and frank uh, with us. I uh, leave the floor now to Stefano Marguccio. Uh, Stefano Marguccio is currently a senior advisor uh, to Director General of IRENA, International Renew Renewable Energy Agency in Abu Dhabi, which we have heard is an extremely interesting place uh, to be also with for our conversation we are having today. I've been in the Gulf area for quite some time recently and I could see the evolution. And uh, Marguccio is an Italian career diplomat and he has been deputy head of the Policy Planet uh, Unit at the Ministry for the Environment, uh, at the Ministry of, sorry, for Foreign Affairs, and uh, he has been uh, the diplomatic advisor to the Minister of, uh, for the Environment. So, Mr. Marguccio, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, it has been very interesting to, to listen to the other panelists. I, I really appreciate it today. The fever paragon of, of uh, Professor Price, I think it, uh, it gives a, a very clear idea of how a small rise in temperature that is a small number can, can have incredible effects on, on, on the planet and over, on our life. Uh, well, I, here in, in, uh, in my actual capacity, I'm, I'm dealing with, with uh, renewable energy, so I will start with that, but I cannot uh, let's say, throw away my background as a, as a diplomat. Uh, and I would also like to uh, touch on some security issues that are related both to climate and, 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 uh, and their energy transition. What I can say from, from the ARENA perspective is that the energy transition is already a reality. Uh, if we look at the numbers of uh, uh, new capacity of, uh, of electricity that has been uh, uh, installed in 2020, we can see that uh, 2020 was the record year of, of renewable energy in the planet. Uh, the, the, the new installed capacity was 260 gigawatt, which is a very significant number. And uh, uh, if we see the comparison with the new installed capacity of fossil fuel, uh, the number was for fossil fuel only 60 gigawatt. Uh, so, Renewables are running, 
and uh, and China is leading uh, the the installed capacity of of the planet. So of these 260 gigawatt, uh, 136 were installed in China, uh, which gives a very clear idea on how uh, the Chinese government is is really moving. Uh, and shifting the, the, the energy production uh, of China to, to renewables. Uh, the second country for installed capacity of renewables last year was, however, the USA, uh, with 29 gigawatts of, of renewable energy installed, uh, which is anyhow an interesting number. It's, of course, a smaller number uh, in comparison to, to China, but we if we compare the territory and the population, probably uh, uh, we are almost there. I mean, I mean the, the, the population of China is probably at least three times the one of, of, uh, of the US. And uh, uh, one other number that I think is significant is that the new installed capacity of, of renewables in uh, Africa as a whole was 2 gigawatt, 2.6. Uh, so a very, very small number. What I can say as well to, to, to stress how this energy transition is already in place is uh, that the financial markets are moving in this direction as well. Uh, if we look at the uh, Standard & Poor Index for uh, Global Clean Energy, uh, this number was uh, increasing 138% in 2020, while uh, the Standard & Poor 500 energy index, which is full of oil and gas companies, was down 37%. Uh, I think this is another way to say that also the financial markets are betting on, on the transition. Uh, what we say in IRENA is that the pace is too slow uh, and that the next 10 years will be crucial uh, to meet the Paris Agreement targets. If we want to stay into the 1.5 degrees target, we have to uh, let's say increase this space and invest much more in in renewables. Uh, so this is what I see as as the panorama. I mean, I see that the trend is there, and uh, I see that China is leading is leading also by the fact that seventy percent of the uh, solar panel market is in the hands of Chinese companies. Seventy percent is a huge share of the market. Uh, it's slightly different on the uh, wind, uh, where uh, where uh, there is more competition. But anyhow, uh, the Chinese company are are uh, are leading, uh, and this, of course, could create a, a natural nexus of cooperation between the, the Euro Mediterranean area and China. Uh, but then I want to also stress some of the security issues. Some of the security issues have been already presented by, by Professor Price, uh, and they are related to, uh, I mean, the, the, the direct effects of desertification, of, of uh, uh, what the impact of climate change can give to, to resources like water and agriculture, and which are the outcomes on, on uh, uh, the world population, and of course, especially in, in, uh, in the Mediterranean region. I want to add on that, uh, that if we are embracing energy transition, then it's possible that we will have a strong competition, if not a war on resources. Uh, energy transition is based on, on uh, uh, rare earths, on uh, lithium, on cobalt, on graphite, nickel, all the resources that are there, of course, uh, are distributed uh, unevenly in the planet, as often happens. So uh, there is a lithium triangle in, in Latin America. Uh, there is a huge cobalt uh, uh, storage in in, uh, in, uh, in Congo, Kinshasa. Rare arts, again, is China leading with 37% of the share of the market. Uh, so the control of these resources is key for sure for the, for the energy transition of the future and is a concern uh, for, for all uh, the security people starting from, from Washington. Uh, even if, on the other hand, I must say that 
there is a, a strong space for, for recycle and reuse, especially in the solar panel sector. So these fears about resources can be limited if there will be developing, uh, we will develop a, a, a true market of, of uh, uh, recycle and reuse of, of uh, uh, the renewable energy uh, plants. And the other security issue that I would like to stress is the one of energy transition in uh, oil and gas dependent countries. I'm, I'm living in the Gulf right now. As, as you said, uh, Silvia, it is true that especially here, uh, they, they saw the trend, they are investing heavily in, in, in uh, solar, they are investing in hydrogen right now as well. Uh, but we cannot uh, avoid to think that, uh, I mean, the population of the UAE is, uh, is accustomed not to pay taxes, is accustomed to have services, and all this uh, social pact is based on the revenues of oil. And this is true for, for the UAE, it is true for Saudi Arabia, it's true for many other countries. I've been also in Venezuela, where the state was built, 93% of the budget of the state was due to oil revenues. Uh, so we have to think that if we are pushing for energy transition, and this is what we need to do, the consequences of the social pact in many countries that are close to Israel, that are close to Italy, uh, will be put to a strain. And uh, this is something that has to be faced somehow. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's a one of the effects of the energy transition that we are not thinking about uh, too much in depth, but we should uh, go a little bit more. I mean, if I look at the, at the list of the top 10 oil exporters and producers, there are many countries in the area. There is uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran. Uh, and if this uh, uh, socket of, of oil will be closed because in 10, 15 years, we don't want oil anymore, this country will be, especially if I think about Iraq and Iran, in a very, very uh, dire situation. And this, of course, will increase uh, conflictuality in an area that has been always at the center of conflict. Even if I think about the UAE, the last civil war between Dubai and Abu Dhabi was in, the, in 1945. So uh, this can sparkle really, really a, 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 a fire in the Gulf and, and, and uh, uh, the Mediterranean region. On the other side, if you want to see the bright side, we, of course, have a lot of opportunities. Uh, what I think is that hydrogen is a, is a, is a big opportunity because uh, it's a way to have, if we talk about green hydrogen, of course, uh, a possibility of storage and transport that is not uh, so easy for, for uh, other renewable energy sources, even if I'm talking about hydrogen, so also transport and storage is not easy. Uh, but, but I mean, there are companies that are still consider, already considering using their uh, gas duct to uh, transport uh, hydrogen in the future and not gas anymore. Uh, so hydrogen is, a, is a, for example, a, a, a big battle for the Morocco government. Of course, Morocco is, is one of the few countries of, of the Mediterranean Gulf that doesn't have uh, oil or gas. So uh, for them, it's the, the, the answer to, to their energy dependency. Uh, well, the panorama is, is if we think about the transition in, in the, with the optics of security, if we think about the future of Libya, if you think about the future of uh, Algeria, I mean, uh, we have to be enthusiast about the energy transition, but we have also to be aware that we need to have very, very clever and effective policies to mitigate the effects of energy transition. And with this, I close. 
Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank also Mr. Bonazzi who had to leave us. Um, thank you so much for your uh, contribution. And uh, thank you, Dr. Marcucci, because uh, you touched upon two fundamental issues, I think. One is the raw material for renewables, which can lead to some uh, controversy and uh, you also spoke about uh, the need to invest also on, uh, um, you know, um, renew the renewables, <laughs> like recycle the renewables. And, uh, and I think this is extremely important in terms, in geopolitical terms, of course, because we cannot uh, uh, get rid of some dependency to move to other dependencies and to change so dramatically and perhaps so quickly the entire geopolitical world. So the second point you have touched upon, which I think is extremely important, uh, is the fact that, and that goes back to what uh, Dr. Klini said before as well, uh, whatever the tensions can be among countries, climate change uh, needs global cooperation. And these countries, which are facing a transition themselves, like the Gulf, for example, or you mentioned Libya, or you mentioned Algeria, need to be supported in their transition because it's not just a matter of, of, of saying, okay, we change the energy from oil, we move to you know, solar, for example, Saudi Arabia could do that. Actually, uh, the Crown Prince uh, uh, announced it, right? Uh, by 2030, 50% will be renewables. But the point is that what you also raised is a social issue as well. I mean, people are accustomed to all those benefits coming from this status quo. So it's, uh, it, it, it can trigger so many things. And again, whatever the tensions, whatever the relationships between countries, I do think that it is important to support them. Uh, global, global, global issue and global reform, I would say. So thank you very much for focusing uh, on, on, on that. Uh, just one question for you. We don't have much time left, uh, perhaps uh, eight minutes more, uh, no more than that. I have one question, one minute answer for you, <laughs> if you can, and then I go back to Professor Price and Dr. Klini. Um, how do you see this happening in the Gulf? You just made, uh, uh, you know, an agreement, I think, with IRENA, uh, with the Gulf. Uh, is it feasible? I mean, the, all the deadlines that we have fixed, are they reachable? Well, uh, as I said, I think they, they, they saw the trend. Uh, there was recently a meeting of, of uh, the Gulf community countries here in Abu Dhabi called by the UAE when uh, John Kerry came on a state visit. Uh, and uh, all the climate envoys of the Gulf are, are ready to act. And I think there is a clear uh, awareness that, as I said in the beginning, the energy transition is already happening and they have to act. And uh, everyone, I mean, if we see the temperature of the Gulf, uh, it's a record high ever. Uh, now it's probably 41. Uh, a few days ago, I think in Qatar, it was 48, the highest ever May uh, in the history of Qatar. Of course, this uh, is in conflict with uh, uh, sustainability and, and energy efficiency of the country, but at the same time, uh, they are moving. And uh, for example, what happened also uh, with the pandemic and, and the blockade of, of uh, international uh, uh, trade for a, for a short while, uh, they invested here in the UAE in agriculture strongly and they are aiming to achieve 50% of independence, of, uh, of food independence. I mean, I think that all the climate-related issues are a reality, and all the countries are ready to move. Uh, 
And of course, the pace will be key to see if uh, they can achieve their targets in time. Uh, and uh, well, here, this area, as I said, is one of the most delicate areas ever. I think the leadership of the Gulf uh, has been enlightened and they're well aware of, of uh, their need to face this future uh, in a very responsible way. Uh, the news of, of the UAE uh, candidate for hosting uh, the, the COP28, I think is, is another signal that they want to lead on this. Uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic, but of course, as I said, it's, it's a very, very delicate and complicated issue. Yeah, it's a challenge, it's complicated. I, I will go back to Professor Price for a moment. We have like uh, only a few minutes left, but I was very impressed by many other things you have said. One of those was 73% of the Chinese population perceive climate change as a threat, much more than, than the Europeans, for example. What do you think uh, has triggered this thinking among the Chinese population? So I'm not sure. I was also surprised to see that statistic. But I think one thing is that the government is becoming much more open to climate change. Also, simply that it's very polluted in China, so people can't even breathe the air. So they see there's a, some people may not link the air pollution to climate change, and they're not, maybe not directly linked. But when you see and you can't breathe the air in Beijing, then people are much more aware of the environment that there's a problem and that this is linked to climate change and using fossil fuels. And I think once the government has decided that this is on their agenda to deal with climate change, then the public comes on board in China. Things work a little differently in, in, in China than in other countries. Um, so and there are positive things and, and negative things to that. Obviously, with maybe with climate change, there's some positive issues that the, once the government decides it's on their agenda to, 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 to basically invest in renewables and set up a grid around the globe. It's going to happen. Uh, they don't need to ask anyone else. <laughs> so um, I'm pleasantly surprised that uh, they actually are so supportive that both the population and the government has come, come on board. Yes, thank you very much. I do think that, uh, yeah, the air pollution issue is, is, is quite relevant. And uh, WHO is telling us that millions of people die every year for by air pollution, actually. I think uh, something like... Uh, it's about 7 million, yeah. 7 million, right? So, yeah. I mean, for us, COVID, of course, is a super threat uh, because it's more visible as well. Perhaps uh, dying by air pollution is less visible, yet it is uh, happening. Right. And, I, and the numbers are very clear there as well. Perhaps uh, in, uh, in China, Beijing in particular, that was mostly felt by the population. So there is more awareness. Uh, but I think it is a challenge also for us to make the link, to make public opinion make this link uh, very clear. I mean, it exactly. Is, I, I think the only way we can really sell it to the public is to link climate change as a health health risk to the public. Um, when you COVID is a, obviously a clear health risk, but most people don't link climate change with a health risk, and it's a definitely it's maybe even a bigger health risk, not just the air pollution, but heat waves and uh, tropical storms and flooding and and uh, poverty. And so um, the public, once, when, when the public realizes that this is really a health issue as well for the future, it may get more people on board. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, Dr. Klini is a medical doctor as well. So I guess he agrees with us. Is that? I, I was a medical doctor in my previous life. <laughs> but <laughs> of course, of course, air pollution, uh, and the carbon emissions uh, are uh, uh, really connected, really linked. If we consider the effects of uh, black carbon, black carbon is both polluting uh, the atmosphere and uh, increasing the uh, climate uh, effects. 
So this is a real issue. And uh, if you look at this, uh, we can understand why in Europe we have a lot of discussion because to address the issue of air pollution and climate change, we have to change from coal to, re <laughs> to renewables. We have to limit uh, uh, natural gas power plants. We have to reduce air pollution from traffic. And so we have to introduce hydrogen or electric cars. And so I believe that uh, on this side, the, the, the public opinion is uh, now considering the linkages between climate change and air pollution. But another main issue is, uh, is coming up is uh, the climate stream. Climate streams are affecting many countries in Europe and uh, we need to work in uh, the adaptation. Adaptation means investments in, in uh, many infrastructures for protecting the land, for protecting the coastal zone, for protecting urban areas. And also this is uh, becoming, uh, um, I can say, a key issue in the discussion on the future. If you look at the uh, adaptation strategy adopted by the European Parliament last month, we can see that Europe is trying to design a new way for managing, for land use, for land managing. And this is another very interesting, but also very challenging issue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much. I think adaptation deserves a, another conversation. It's for sure something that needs to be uh, discussed uh, alongside mitigation. So I thank you all very much. And I look forward to meeting all you in person. I hope very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you bye. very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.